Hey folks, I'm Creatorius Rex, sometimes referred to as Brett Kinsella, but today what I'm doing is I'm representing Niftorian, or I'm talking about my experience with a recent Niftorian event called Demo Day, and this is a special edition of the Niftorious Show. We did this after the first Demo Day back in March, and we just had another one uh, this week at the end of June. It's the culmination of the NFT Artist Accelerator, the world's only NFT Artist Accelerator. And to help me out, I've got my two friends, Roger Kibbe and David Conquest. Gentlemen, welcome. Hi, Brett. Thanks. Hi, Brett. All right. Uh, thank you, Kipster, for coming back on the show. This is, I believe, David's first appearance on the Niftoria show. So welcome. It is. It is. Exciting and that's a time. really, really nice uh, picture you have in the background. I see that you have all of the artists from the accelerator blown up on your wall. Uh, I love it that you've got physical art behind you to promote this event. Indeed. Well, I couldn't come on this show talking about demo day and not include the artists. Could I? All right. So we, we have uh, 13 artists to talk about today. So that's going to take a few minutes and we need to get right into it. But First, I think we should orient everybody because not everybody knows what Demo Day is. It's NF NFT Demo Day. And, uh, and, and, but Demo Day is the culmination, as I just said, of the accelerator. So maybe, Roger, why don't you walk people through what the accelerator is? Yeah, sure. So the accelerator, really, it's modeled after technology accelerators. And the whole idea in this case is to get a group of artists together who have been, you know, successful in the art world, but have done little or just kind of emerging into the NFT world. And over a seven week uh, period, uh, we had them talk to a lot of industry experts. We talked to them about the NFT world, how to succeed, how to market, et cetera, and really gave them the kickstart that's needed for them to uh, succeed and in this new nft world which is so exciting for artists and that culminated in the demo day yeah demo day and it's funny too because roger you and i were helping artists last fall we were having these like one-off conversations a lot of them were friends of scojo's and then it didn't seem like it was helping them that much i mean they would get like this one nugget and then like what would what happens the next day right and uh and so that's why we structured this program uh so that they go through and it's like a blueprint for them. And, you know, our goal ultimately is to help a million artists get into web three and uh, the NFT artist accelerator is one of those, get them off to that really strong start. And if I think about it, like we gave them the structure, we give them some resources that they can use to sort of map things out. Uh, we walk through a little bit of a curriculum of some basics that they need to know about the space. But to me, one of the biggest things that happens is we have all these outside parties come in, like friends of the group, uh, come in yeah. to share their knowledge and expertise. You know, who of those uh, were most impressive to you, Roger? Oh, boy. Um, so I love the marketplace talks. So talking to uh, object right. uh, and art blocks, because I think it's both both are very interesting and innovative in what they've done. Um, I lo love talking to, to Turhan. Troy Kalak about, talked about stories, right? Because that's such new, for artists, that's new to think about. I need to tell a story that goes along with my art. And so Turhan, who's an actor and also very active in the NFT world, is great around uh, getting them to tell stories. So those are the ones that kind of really stick out in my mind. What about you, David? Favorite speakers that came to the Yeah, I, the, the story um, sessions were um, really good because that's a whole other aspect to the whole side of NFTs that artists just um, wouldn't necessarily think about. And they've got to go through this whole, they've got to take their, their collectors through a whole emotional process about how they um, connect to the NFTs and linking art to utility and to real people. Yeah, that's great. You know, surprising one of the favorite uh, sessions, and this is for those of you who don't know what goes on in the accelerator, these expert guests come in and it just opens up all new ideas, opportunities for folks who are in there. And uh, a, a fan favorite or a participant favorite is the lawyer who comes in, Jack, Zach Shapiro. He tells him how not to get in trouble uh, with IP rights and, and doing things that might get you uh, on the radar of the uh, securities election or the securities uh, folks, the federal 
securities uh, regulators. Um, and then Wolf Fleetwood Ross joined us for the first time this year. I thought he was great. Talk about seasons. He's he's the leader of the Cat Blocks NFT project. He talks a lot about building community. I thought that was pretty amazing. So we've got a lot of super supporters in this. And so if you're an artist and you're thinking about it, um, just go to niftorian.com, uh, uh, click the accelerator button. Uh, it's up in the top in the nav and you'll see there's, you can learn more about the artist. You can more about the program and you can apply. Uh, we will have season three coming up or excuse me, class three coming up this fall. Uh, so you need to apply now because we're going to start interviewing probably in August and, uh, that class will start in September. Uh, so really good stuff there. Now we talked about this culminating in demo day. So just before we get into that, David, tell people what demo day is. Yeah, Demo Day is when it all comes together. So the artists learnt all these things throughout the Accelerator. And Demo Day is like the uh, show at the end of an art class. It's when they get to show off what they're doing. Um, we take them uh, one by one. They each, each get five minutes to talk about what they've been doing and present their projects. And for, for a lot of them, it's the first time they've actually spoken publicly about their new projects. Um, yeah. which is great because it gives them great experience, but it also means that any collectors watching get in on the ground floor of some brand new projects. And for some of the artists, it's the first time they've even minted NFTs. Yes. Yeah, that's um, true. So Several of them about, minted. Talk about get, so talk Several. about getting in early. Um, yes. You know, who knows um, who you're going to get, who, who knows who you're going to get hold of. You know, it's a chance for the artists to actually market their own work. In the traditional art world with galleries and et cetera, often the artist isn't directly marketing their work, right? The gallery's marketing their work or some third party is. And so um, really it's an idea of, hey, if you're going to succeed in the NFT world, you're going to need to learn to market your work. And one of the ways to learn to market is to be succinct and concise in exactly what you're doing and present it. And that's why we have that, that five minute limit, succinct, concise get people excited about what you're doing. And so they'll go uh, follow you and learn more. Absolutely. The capstone yeah, just, of just learning. Go ahead, David. Go on. I said, and just learning to be, um, to keep it to five minutes is a skill in itself, yes. um, which they had, they had to learn. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we have talked about demo day two. That was on the 29th. And I do want to just bring up one other thing and we're gonna to get to the artists. Uh, we actually have gotten a lot of feedback from people in the community, a lot of artists who, who wanna be part of the accelerator, but either they don't have time or it's a competitive process, so maybe they didn't get accepted. And so we we're trying to think of a way to scale this. And one of the things that occurred to us having been to some of the conferences in the space is that the conferences in the NFT space are all very collector focused, investor focused, maybe vendor or software provider focused, there's really none that are artist focused. And really, if we think about this idea, what do you need to know? What do you need to do next? What do you need to avoid? What should you do for best practices? Those types of things. And so what we decided to do is put on what we call NFT Artist Con. You can see there's the QR code and the bit.ly link right there. It's going to be August 17th, uh, 2022. So we'd love to have you there. Uh, it's free and is an event. And our goal is really just, as we talked about earlier, we're trying to help a million artists on board into Web3. So uh, come by. I think we're going to have amazing speakers. Uh, I think you'll learn a lot. And, you know, over about a four hour period, you'll get a probably a master class and uh, an artist success in the NFT land. So I definitely recommend people check that out. Now, next up, we have a whole lot of artists and we should get right to that. And our first, our first project that was presented was by David Cohen. Uh, people might know him as Doodle Slice, and it is the Yellow Shirt Squad. So, Roger, what are your thoughts on the Yellow Shirt Squad? You know, why I love the Yellow Shirt Squad is it's fun and light and entertaining. And in this world of, you know, our news now is off. Oh, well, news in general is, is negative. And so he does this fun, light, entertaining uh and, and really cute pictures that are just, uh, you can't, it can't help but bring a smile to your face when you see uh, David's work. And so I, I just, I, I found it refreshing and, and fun. 
How about you, David? Yeah, I mean, what he does is great. Um, the idea of these yellow shirts with slogans on um, just looks amazing. But it, this, the, how he links um, this comic style um, innocence of the images to to a better meaning, and it brings in some of the other work he does around poetry as well. Um, and of course, he's already got his website running where you can buy buy your mug with um, his <laughs> artwork true. on. So he's got um, the commercial side of it sorted as well. Well, you know, it is interesting. It is a very uh, what I think of as a commercial project or a commercial friendly project because it had such broad appeal. I mean, those characters that he's created, it's almost a lo its own little world. They're very friendly. And his message was basically, if you give me five seconds, I'll give, I'll give you a, a smile for two minutes or something like that, uh, which is great. And he really talks about this idea that it's a fast paced world. There's a lot of negativity and really what he wanted to do with this project. And he does many other things, as you mentioned, David, uh, in terms of poetry and other illustrations. What he really wanted to do is just help people get away from maybe the negativity in the world just for a few seconds each day, put a smile on their face. Maybe it's humorous. Maybe it's a little uh, thing that they can take with them. And I love that. And one of the things he's really doing is he's doing this on the Tezos blockchain. It's really inexpensive uh, because really he just wants to get it out there. He wants a lot of people to have access to this. He publishes it obviously on Instagram and on Twitter uh, when he puts them out as well. But if anybody wants a yellow shirt squad, they can get the token on uh, an object on the Tezos blockchain. And then because of the nature of it, as you said, it's perfect for t-shirts and mugs. Great way to start the day. Exactly. A uh, yellow shirt squad mug. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So uh, that yep. was David Doodle Slice Cohen. And Doodle Slice is how you find him on social. Uh, next up, we had Susie Chan. And Susie Chan is a really interesting artist. Uh, she started as an artist later uh, in, in life. Um, although she's still quite young. Uh, and she did it through this own personal journey that she had uh, where she was going through this process of health self-acceptance, which I thought was really interesting. She you know, told her own story and how art you know, helped her through that process. And so she's created this project called The Healing Dimension. And I think of it kind of like a utility first project. There's definitely art associated with it. There's NFTs, um, but it has all these other services that basically connecting people to resources and a process to go through. She outlines what the journey is for self-acceptance and, and people who are feeling lonely or maybe inadequate. Uh, and then, then there's ways to connect with other people who have been through that before. And she's got the healing portal. I just felt that there was so much here. And I will say too, I'll give her the nod for, uh, maybe the, I don't want to say the most improved. I want to say the most evolved from when we talked to her, in the interview before she was accepted to the program to what she delivered. Uh, I really thought it was tremendous. The growth that we saw from, uh, from her in this space, but also the sophistication of what she was putting together to help people. Hmm. What do you think, David? Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, her art is wonderful and um, the art's beautiful, but I agree with you. It's more about, the utility and creating a community, which is what she's trying to do. Um, her aim is to help, I think she said 7.9, she wants to help 7.9 million people, um, which she worked out from being 0.1% of the world's population. So she's got a, a big target, but I think it's doable. I think the way she wants to um, go about it and creating communities, um, basically to help people through um, issues that she's had to deal with herself um, could work really well. Yeah, you know, that that focus on mental health is so spot on with what's going on in the world today, right? We all know, we all know of all, so many challenges that people are are having, right? And certainly the COVID made them even worse. So that's why I, I love that I thought she was addre directly addressing a big societal problem and taking her personal experience Right. And making it very personal. And no, there's no, nothing better than when you take your personal experience and then share it with people. I think that really resonates. And and then that combined with the art, um, I'm, I'm super excited for for her project and 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 super excited for her to be able to share her knowledge and, and help some people in the world. 
Yeah, and completely novel. I mean, we've had a lot of people go through the accelerator now, have, have been done a couple of these. You know, we've got a couple dozen people who have put together projects, and this is a, a completely new one. That's what we find, like these new innovations every time, not just in terms of the concept, but the execution. And so I'm really excited to see uh, where this goes next. And one of the benefits of Demo Day, uh, after after they present, we do it. It took about an hour, 45 minutes or so to get through all the presentations. Then each of the artists has breakout rooms. And so it's like a conference type of setup and you just sort of walk out of the main room and then you go into, it's virtual, you go into the other ones. And we had about a hundred uh, plus people attend the, the main stage for the presentations. But then a lot of them actually then went to speak directly with the artists. And I dropped into to Susie's room and she was getting a collaboration going with someone who was in the audience, who was impressed by what she was doing and uh, wanted to, wanted to do something together. So I thought that was great. You know, that exposure can lead to lots of things. Like people were buying uh, some of the NFTs that people had just launched that day. Some people were getting collaborations. Other people were getting like partners that are going to help them from a, from a technical standpoint. I thought it was just great serendipity. Okay, next up. Here's somebody who sold a few NFTs yesterday. It was like a special release. Robert de Grenier with Vitroverse. He actually they're not going to release till next month, but he opened it up on OpenSea for just people for basically who had attended for a few hours. They could grab a Vitroverse. Uh Roger, you know something about this project. Why don't you weigh in? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Robert is a very well-known glass blower. Uh, and so he's an installation artist and does glass. Um, and so what he's doing is uh, part of his latest uh, glass buying project is uh, this installation that has all these globes that represent planets. And so you can buy an NFT for each of, I think it's 100 plus. Uh, 200. Uh, 200. Thank you for yep. correcting me. 200 different globes. And you buy an NFT that represents that. And then he's looking at some kind of interactivity where if you own the NFT, you can you can change some things uh, that then will actually be reflected in the physical art art piece that's uh, in in a uh, in a gallery. So that's super cool, right? Mixing the physical and the digital world there. Uh, and then the the NFT, you know, they're 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 planets, so they have different attributes about how many of you know, the different elements that make up them. And he's thinking about a whole kind of gamifying that so this is super i thought this was so cool because it was the mix of the the physical right a very well-known established physical artist right. step back and said well what can i do with nfts and i thought he came up with something very clever that is really going to resonate with people so um i bought one of those yesterday i'm super excited <laughs> to see this i want to go visit the physical art installation too so uh Absolutely. Uh, they are very cool stuff. Yeah, you know, and, and Robert's really well known. Uh, like you, like the people here might not know his name, but they know his work. So for example, the Statue of Liberty, when they redid the flame, he did the glass model for it. Uh, the, I think he did the ESPY awards, uh, the MTV awards. Like he's done a lot of awards. He's done like uh, several fragrance bottles uh, for like leading leading fragrances. And in fact, he, in one, he worked with Prince. Uh, Prince's wife was creating something and then Prince did the soundtrack um, and he did the packaging for this, this thing. Uh, his stuff is amazing. He's got stuff in billionaires' homes and their private collection and things like that. So it was really interesting too that we've only had a couple of people who are primarily focused on physical art. Uh, so being a glass sculptor mm -hmm. uh, and and then the idea here of like, how do you integrate something like NFT ownership? And this idea that, you know, each one of those globes, because they are glass and you can put a LED light behind them so they can light up, which is the museum installation that he was commissioned to do. Uh, then allowing people to change the color of the, of the light. So if you own the NFT, you can actually change the color, which I think is like, is really clever. Um, and that would, and that's going to be reflected in how, people in the museum experience it, which will change as different people own the NFTs and change the lights. What were your thoughts on this, David? Um, I think the, Robert's art is incredible and the breadth of what he's done um, is just amazing. But for me, the most exciting thing about this project actually was the app that he uses because that's really bringing in um, 
something that people can hold in their hands in an app on their phone into the NFT world. And that as a form of utility will be so powerful. If you can control an LED going off with your phone because you've got an NFT, then you can do anything. The app could do absolutely anything. So I think that's um, definitely something to look at what he's been doing there. And that could be the way forward for utility. Yeah, I love it. I mean, and, and this is like one of those examples of a famous artist moves into the NFT world and you can actually get something from them that you wouldn't, that would be really expensive if you tried to like, access their collection in the physical world, like one of their pieces. Uh, but you can get a piece of that. And then, oh, you know, there's one other thing with Robert's project too that I forgot. There's this piece of utility. If you own one of the tokens, you actually can go to his studio yep. in Vermont and he will give you a glass blowing class, which I think is like maybe the coolest utility I've heard of any of these things this year, because I don't know about <laughs> glass blowing, but I think it's really cool. I'd love to learn from the master. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So next up we had Magdalena Madrigal and she had tokens collections of moments in time. Now this is a, poetry and text project uh, that she's putting together. And so this is also interesting because most of the things we see are very visually oriented, uh, but we've, we've been working with a few different people who are doing things with text-based expression. And Magdalena is a really interesting person. She's got a podcast where she's interviewed over a hundred people about their advice to, to young people. Uh, also ask them about their own experiences going through uh, different key moments in time or passage, you know, you think about life passages and this uh, occurred to her because nobody told her what she should be doing. Like when she's in college, like what to major in or why you might consider something else when you get out, like getting that first job, how to act when you're in your first job, how to react to the first time. Maybe you have a challenge in your job, changing jobs. Should you all these different passages or these key moments. And she has chronicled all of this, She's, you know, still in, still in her late twenties, I think at this point. Um, in fact, I don't know exactly how she is, but she's younger than 30. And, uh, and what she has here, she's got the concept of whatever this key moment is. She has a poem associated with it. She has a, she has a written piece about like her experience going through that. And that is partially made up of quotes from specific people either that were mentors to her, she met around that time and gave her advice or she'd interviewed on the podcast. And so it's really this, this depth of, um, I don't know what you'd really call it, but it's like this handbook for you know getting through life. And I think it's gonna be really interesting for people to engage with it because if you own the NFT, you, you get all the pieces of, of that moment. And then over time that gets put into a compilation. So I, I really like this one. I think it was really clever. I don't know of anything else like this in the NFT land. What do you think, David? Yeah, absolutely. And it's another project where the, uh, the utility is at least as important as the art and where she's trying to create a community and um, reach out to people. And, um, in a way similar to Susie, but she is being able to identify moments in life where people might be feeling alone, might be feeling they're by themselves, don't know who to, they can reach out to. And so she's providing that for people so that they can um, connect with someone. Yeah, you know, I, I listened to a couple episodes of her podcast just to get up familiar with who she was and and that. And, you know, it's this kind of, career life coaching just just how to how to succeed in life and then bring in i thought it was really unique to bring bring that to the nft world and you're going to buy something text-based but behind that is this advice i i it's a really interesting experiment in bringing something i haven't seen before in the nft world and bringing it in so kudos to her for going this is what i do now let me be creative about thinking about what I can do with NFTs. So I, I'm I'm excited to see this 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 launch and see what happens and pretty pretty unique and innovative. Yeah, it, it it's also interesting too. You talk about sort of the relational, the humanist quality of what she's providing to people, so that they might you know understand that they're not going through it alone, and that they might have a little good advice, mm -hmm. just a way to think through you know how to go through these key moments in life. 
what you might not know is that she's actually very technical. She's a data scientist. And so she's, she's wearing both of those, that left brain, right brain hat. And I think that leads to this idea that you have all of this, this material that she captured, you know, which in like detailed form. Uh, and then there's a way for you to access more of it. So I thought that was really great. Okay. So, oh, and I should point out to folks, uh, in each of these, we've been putting the, the, the Twitter handle, uh, so you can just follow them and you can learn more about it, but also look in the show notes. Cause we're going to have a link down there, which will, you, it'll take you to a Google doc, which has, uh, which has URLs for all these different projects where you can click in, learn more, learn more about the artists, learn more about the project. So I think that'll be useful for folks. Okay, next up, Clipping Suburbia Japan from Lee Day. What do you think, David? I love this project. Um, Lee has, Lee's been doing these sorts of images for quite a while, but um, is now converting them into NFTs and he's been to Japan. And what he does is he takes his iPhone in panorama mode and basically lets the phone record a, uh, an image as the train goes along. So you end up with all these um, kind of clips of the, um, the landscape or um, suburbia as he goes past. And as I, as I said on the day, I just love the idea of using a train as a camera. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it's different than a different than a tripod for sure, and it's you know it it's really interesting because uh, the the panorama function on an iPhone, for example, is designed to have movement. But what he realized was that's designed for you to pivot in place. And he said, "Well, what happens if we don't pivot? If we take it on the linear plane, and to see what happened?" And one of the things you know, talking to him about this in a little bit more detail during the accelerator. We we're talking about this idea of trying to differentiate what humans see versus what AI sees. And you know, frankly, this, this creation that you see on the screen here and the many others in the collection, that's actually what the AI sees. If it, it basically takes a bunch of different moments and it puts it together and it's identifying things that it thinks are important, which may or may not be what the human eye thinks are important. Uh, Roger, you work in the AI space. What do you think? Yeah, well, first, I know he discovered this by happenstance, as I understand. It was a mistake. And then he was like, which I love that idea. You know, yes. it's a mistake, but there's something cool there. And uh, yeah, Brett, it's really interesting you're talking about it's what the AI sees and what do we see. And you look in the picture and it's, it's kind of illustrative of, of, okay, here's AI captured this. What are we seeing? Where's the, the, where's the humanity? Where's the AI in there? Um, they, they definitely, it makes you think. I also, I just, I, I'm a big fan of photography. And right. My father was a photographer and I love people experimenting with photography and kind of, you know, using new digital techniques, using AI and, and doing things that are totally could not be done before or are much easier with, with AI and, for, and, and, and the modern tools there. So uh, good job, Lee, with experimenting and, and using, you know, photography has been down for a long time, but now you're taking this modern tool and this modern technology and combining it with photography and creating something unique and interesting. Yeah, I definitely recommend people go look at these images too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, follow me, mm -hmm. he's at Man in the Machine, but you can go to uh, his website where he has these. And if it's not clear here, what happens is you have these vertical panels you know, essentially that come out. And that's what the, the, like the iPhone algorithm decides what these things are. Uh, and it puts it together. It's almost like this uh, collage that we, yeah. that we see, uh, but it's created by the algorithm. So I think that's uh, pretty fun. Uh, next up. Oh, Christine, Julie. Uh, I love this intercepting planes, NFT. Roger, why don't you lead off this discussion? Yeah, so Christine is an installation artist who builds these installations that are these moving lights. And it's very physical. It's something you need to walk through or by and see that. So her big challenge was, okay, um, I build these, you know, very physical things that you kind of need to be there physically to see. What do I do in the NFT world? Um, and so I talked to her a lot about this and back and forth. And she rather said, you know, I want to, I'm looking at the metaverse, right? This 3D world. And I think I can build 3D models 
you know, using tools like Blender that are representative of these lights, right? A light show in the metaverse um, that maybe is, is it'll be a different, I, I was going to say it's a different experience, but it's neat that the metaverse with its kind of 3D, you know, web three view of the, of the world allows an artist like Christine, who's so physical, right? And, and does things with these lights. Now she's like, wow, there is now a technology where you sitting at your desktop could go in and spin around and rotate and see it in, in an equivalent or, or, or the closest equivalent of actually seeing my art in a, in a, in the physical space. So, um, that's that's really what she's trying to do. I'll, I'll say the first thing she's trying to do, which I think a lot of artists should consider, is you go to her one of her exhibits and there'll be a QR code or a bit.ly. Boom, you link there. She's going to capture an email and she's thinking about sending you like a free, you know, an NFT of her artwork, which I think is a great way for physical artists to start getting into the NFT world mm -hmm. is and start building an a list of the people who are already your fans who you then as you create NFTs and go more digital, you have a place to market to. Yeah, indeed. Um, I think what she does is really clever. Um, her physical work creates, she creates these like 3D webs and then shines light through them. And being able to recreate that in the metaverse, I think will be really powerful. Yeah, I love it. And you know, one of the things that's really interesting about installation artists is that it's the, it's not ephemeral, but it's time limited, right? So, mm -hmm. what I what I'm interested in having her do eventually with some of these installations is every time she does one, take a video of the experience, mint that as an NFT, uh, so that she has some sort of blockchain record of all these different activities, and maybe there's like. 10 or 12 different views on and what it is. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately the idea that she's going to recreate these for the metaverse, that's like a completely new job title, like metaverse light show or um, installation artist. Right. Uh, so I, I think that's really super clever. I'm excited to see more from her in this space because again, like we talked about with Robert de Grenier, NFTs aren't just for digital artists. There are so many different things that we can do with it, whether it's a, you know, essentially support and program and this experience that Magdalena and Susie are doing, or like some sort of physical um, or representation of ownership um, of a physical object. I love it. Okay. So another really innovative one that, uh, that I love is Codeverse by David Uloa. Um, Roger, why don't you throw throw down on this one? Yeah, so um, David is a mathematician and a photographer. And so he's combined his two passions together uh, to create this abstract photography. And he used mathematical algorithms and equations to actually you know, create the abstract view, like this picture we can see of this woman with her face coming out. There's, an, there's a mathematical equation behind that. And so, uh, yeah, Dave, David is really already is starting to do quite well because I think there's people who resonate with this algorithmic photography and the math behind uh, the, the beauty of, of his photography. Um, he's also from Cuba, which was interesting and, and that. And, and, and uh, uh, it was great to have someone represented from there. And uh, I, I, David has a he's doing extremely well. Uh, he's selling things out very quickly an object. If you want to collect something from David, uh, go follow him on object, right? And, and buy right away because it'll sell out within a day or less. Um, so, um, um, very, very cool stuff that really seems, he seems to have hit a chord that's resonating with collectors. So kudos to everything you're doing, David. Yeah. I mean, what he's doing is so clever. Um, it's, basically as, as i understand it he's creating puzzles um out of combination of the art and um mathematics and cryptography and bringing all that together and it, it's really popular it's doing really well i think there's a great market for that kind of work yeah it's really super the and just so people know the codeverse project on object it was identified as one of the object gems so they have a curator and they they determine what are sort of interesting projects by artists and the every 
so often he'll put out a new piece and then people jump on it. And then if they saw, if they're the first to solve the, the puzzle, then they get something else from him. Uh, so I think this has, this has a lot of potential and, you know, kudos to him. I mean, I think also just going through the project, uh, he didn't always have great internet connectivity, uh, being in Cuba, he had maybe some more challenges than other folks have, but, uh, he definitely stuck with it and the, the work comes through. And if, if you go and check out his work, uh, in Codeverse, definitely look closely at the images because you'll see that some of them are a little strange. Some of them are just cool, uh, but they all have these little Easter eggs and that's where you find the puzzles show up. Okay. So next up, let me just make sure I have the right one here. Yep. We have Dark Season by Jillian McDonald. And I think I'll start on this one. So you see this picture in the middle. Um, we've got clowns. Um, this is in, I, David, you remember, what was the, what's the name of the island this was shot on? The island is called Svalbard. It's, yes. um, if you think of the very far north of Norway, and then go halfway to the North Pole from there. That's yes. where Svalbard is, in the, the middle of the ocean up there. Very cold. Okay, so Jillian is really interesting. She's actually a, an art professor at Pace University, and she was uh, selected for a fellowship up in Svalbard, and I guess they were on a boat, and there were 30 artists, and they go in and out of the fjords, and, and everybody who's part of the program puts together some uh, some piece that they're going to create. And hers was this idea of, I don't know what they call it. Is it eco art? But it's basically to raise awareness around what's going on in, uh, in the North with the polar caps and all these other things up in the Arctic. And, uh, and, and she, <laughs> she, you know, she had this idea that it's kind of like a horror film, what's happening from a climate standpoint. Uh, and oh, by the way, she's done a lot of video work or filmmaking work in the horror genre. So she created these little horror like skits or uh, scenes, I should say, is the right way to say it, um, with just these weird things with, like a dead Santa. There's clowns floating on floaties. And <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it is totally bizarre. And she's really got an interesting background. She's done all this type of performance art where she was on the New York City subway and she transformed herself into a zombie and then you see the people reacting to a zombie being on the subway uh, i i think i think this is like a really interesting piece and again one again once again not something i've seen elsewhere in nft land yeah um what she's done is basically taken her earlier work the performance art on the new york subway and continued that and turned it into um she calls it eco horror oh eco horror um, yes yeah um and going to svalbard which is up in the arctic um and the glaciers are melting there and you can see the effects of climate change right in front of you on the island um so she's taken what she her earlier work on the subway and created eco horror with this uh clown walking around on the island it's very clever yeah it, it, it's there's intrigue and mystery in the work you see it and you're like what wait what is going on there and you know i i, I do believe that a lot of great art will start a conversation and her yes. art can definitely start mm -hmm. a conversation and you know it, it's 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 a clever way you know i'd say the environmental movement uh, needs to think, rethink ways of doing their messaging, right, to get across to people. And I thought this was really clever in to say, okay, it's a horror show, what's happening. But I'm going to put these images where you're like, why is there a dead Santa in the middle of, you know, this fjord? And, you know, and, and then you're like, oh, okay. So what a great way to start a conversation. So re re really clever. Yeah. And if you, if you look at it too, this thing just like pops, you're like, oh, okay. If you look at the background, the, the place, the the environment they were in, it was kind of monochromatic, you know, a lot of grays, blacks and whites. Uh, and then all of a sudden you put a clown in the middle of it and that really pops, right? So it just stands out. And so I thought that was, uh, that was particularly striking. So it's not just the subject, but it's like what our expectations of that subject are, which draws attention to this idea of, of, of a clown, uh, a killer clown. Um, so really interesting. 
people, a lot of people in the horror, like who are in Demo Day are interested in the horror genre. So they were interested in this. All right. So next up we have Wall Street Boys by Roz Diamond. And this is actually a pretty famous collection from the 1980s. And each of these uh, pieces is about investment bankers. And I thought that was really also an interesting idea because she was making a cultural commentary about what was going on in Wall Street. If people remember, they've seen the movie uh, Wall Street. You know, you had Gordon Gecko, the Wall Street Titan, greed is good, all of that. And what Roz was doing, she was capturing that moment in time of the, uh, in an abstract way, of the investment bankers. And there's a tie that she's working on with this to the crypto world, too, because there's, there's some similarities to what's going on in the 80s and the, the 2020s now, crypto being at the forefront of that. I think it's a really interesting project. What about you, David? Yeah, I agree. I love the art. Um, I think the way she's um, represented that greed is good is fantastic. And yeah, you're right. There is a, a real resonance between what was happening then and some aspects of the crypto world at the moment. Um, if you look at what's been happening in various projects and to various people, um, it's easy to see a parallel there. I guess the meltdown of 2022 in the crypto world is like the stock market meltdown in 1987, the flash crash. Yeah, sure. very much so. You know, it, it's I, I, I thought too of the I, I love the movie Wall Street because it's so ridiculous and such indicative of the times. And I saw this and I thought of other people like Carl Icahn and Michael Milken and you know those were the Wall Street boys. Um, and so uh, tying that into there's a lot of parallels. Definitely, as you guys are saying, between the go go greed is good 80s and the go go crypto greed is good uh, 2000s, right? Or 20, you know, late, late uh, 2020s and that. So um, good stuff. I, I, th I think it's a retro thing that people who remember the movie and remember those times will identify with. Yes. And then if you bring it back into the crypto world, then you can get a younger generation to will identify with it too. So uh, clever, clever to take retro that also has a modern parallel. Yeah, like it. Okay, well, let's keep you on the mic, Roger. Next up was Michael Pierre Price. Mm -hmm. And I know you know a little bit about what his project was. What'd you think? Yeah, so Michael uh, is a digital artist uh, who's done quite well. Michael wanted to do something quite different, actually. Um, he didn't see the opportunity as selling his artwork as NFTs. Michael wants to work with galleries or corporate clients and say, hey, this is brand new technology, NFTs. How are we going to use NFTs to um, advance both of our business, you know, my interest, for instance, with the gallery and the gallery forward? So he's looking to partner with galleries um, and corporate clients and saying, okay, how can NFTs change the way you do business? And I'll be your artist partner to go experiment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> uh, and, and figure that out. So I, I thought this was really fascinating because I think most people immediately go, okay, I want to sell my art is as NFTs. And Michael's like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. But I want to go find a gallerist who really wants to be innovative and say, how do I display digital art? Instead of, you know, printing my art out, there's monitors up there and how do NFTs tie into all of this there. So I, I think this is probably the, the longer, harder path, um, but I think it'll be very, very intriguing uh, what comes out of this. And I, I think he's kind of, you know, the next one of the next paths or places for NFTs to go is definitely to look at this. You know, the traditional art world, the galleries, the, the well, we'll say, add museums in there, the, the corporate clients who buy there. They haven't been so involved with NFTs to date. They must be looking at it. Why don't you partner with an artist, which is Michael's pitch, uh, who wants to do that with you? So going to be going to be interesting. Indeed. And if you look at the artwork he's producing, I mean, it's just incredible. You'd um, think that any any gallery would want to jump on that. Um, but the way he's approaching it is um, completely different 
to the, the way his project is being, the way he's approaching his project is different to uh, anyone else. As you say, he's trying to partner with people. And I was in his breakout room. It was over two hours after the main event had finished. And there was still like a dozen people in his breakout room talking about what was possible, what they could do. Um, there were artists, there were collectors, there was a couple of business partners, maybe. Um, yeah, he's, um, he's thinking right about how to do this. Yeah, he sparked a lot of discussion. It was uh, we're going to see this in a moment too, but it was it was kind of a red pill discussion for those who like the Matrix reference, because in addition of to the more tactical elements about how it's going to get out in the world and how it's going to he's interested in the NFTs that will draw people to see the physical art, uh, the the physical paintings and those types of things into galleries. Uh, the behind his uh, behind his uh, his art are some really interesting concepts. The one is one is around language and you know, how is language expressed in art? Um, how is language expressed in art through AI systems? Um, and then so how do AI systems interpret language and then um, incorporate art into that or generate art from it and then spiritualism as well. And so there was, there were a lot for people to talk about because he was really tackling at, at one level, these very tactical issues around, you know, getting people to move between one place and the other, like using an NFT to, to get people motivated to move from where they are to a gallery space where they can see physical art. And then this other thing about how you connect through language and technology and spiritualism uh, to higher principles. So really fascinating to see how he's gone. And he's got this fascinating background too. He's a physicist. He was, uh, he's published in physics journals. He was then one of the first game designers at TSR, which is famous for Dungeons and Dragons. He's worked with Coleco, a lot of the big game makers. He was, he actually ran a game making studio for 30 years before he just basically stopped one day and said, you know, the rest of my life is dedicated to art. So really interesting storyline. Okay, next up we have Quantum Mystery from Cynthia D. Donato. David Conquest. Way I was I was Cynthia's mentor during the program, and um, what she's producing is a series of animations. Um, as you can see, this is a still um, you can see here. And she's really interested in the whole idea of um, quantum mechanics and entanglement and, and all of that and about um, moments in time. And so she's trying to create that link between um, quantum theory and how people um, experience, experience time and how they um, can work with that. Um, she's, she started out as a um, phys physical artist and had to teach herself digital. Um, and some of the work she's producing is amazing. Um, I love the animations that she's producing. Her plan is to produce um, an animation every month for the next 12 months um, and, and to mint those. But she's also got a whole other project that she's talking about as well. Um, so we had a, once we had one whole discussion around um, kind of the commercial side of um, producing NFTs, um like where do you where's best to um to present these different projects um which marketplaces are best for which different types of projects um because you've you've got to think about you've got to think like an entrepreneur when you're doing these things um it's tempting for an artist just to put their work out um but with nfts especially it's good to think about where you're doing that yeah you know, I, I was intrigued. I think the the so talking about quantum mechanics and time space continuum. I, I mean, those are pretty lofty, hard to understand concepts. And yet she's using this into our art in a way, maybe to help people explain it or think about more. Maybe the, the deep math behind all these things, but kind of what what does this all mean there? So I, I think that's really interesting. I also, you know, I really love the subtle animations that she's doing. You know, the, the NFT world is awash in fast, high moving, glitchy animations. All you have to do is go to object, right? And you'll see like tons of these glitch things. That's that's great. But 
what really struck me is I saw, and I didn't notice the movement at first. And I'm like, wait a second, something's making my eye go there. And then you'd see the movement. And I, I just, I, I, I think that's great because to, at least to my eye, I almost prefer that subtle animation. You maybe don't first notice, but you're like, why do I keep on watching that? Oh, it's moving. So I think that's really intriguing. Yeah. And if you look at this, there's, there's a lot of detail here. She's really an expert. And in fact, she's, she teaches people how to use a lot of digital uh, art and design tools. Uh, so she's done that for years. And so in that process, she's learned because she taught herself, as you, as you said, uh, and then she wound up learning everything and then doing her own experiments and then being people just kept asking her more and more to do this. And so, you know, I think there's some really interesting things that we will we'll see out of Cynthia, both with this project over the next year and some of the other things she's working on. Uh, next up, we have Cat Lady Club. Roger, what are your thoughts on the Cat Lady Club from Diana Diavila? Well, first of all, Diana has such a great story. Uh, and she's written a book about her story. And, you know, she's this, <laughs> she's in, in the military. She's been in software. She's done really, really just a multi-talented lady. And then she had a problem where she had a brain injury. And coming out of that, this kind of emerged, this savant idea. She was all of a sudden like art was, was something that she hadn't done before. And all of a sudden uh, she was very good at it. Um, and this is a really personal story, actually, the, the Cat Lady Club, because it was the first art that she did, right? Coming off to this brain brain injury and that, and where she discovered, wow, all of a sudden art is something that I'm really passionate about and I have talent and skill at. So I love the fact that it's this personal story. Um, I also, I mean, the cats are cute as can be. <laughs> they're they're cute. They're fun. I, I it's, it's one of those things you can't help look at her cats and not smile. And just like we we're talking about, you know, David doodle slice earlier, right? It's nice to have things that make you smile in your life. And yes. yet behind it is this kind of deep, kind of emotionally, you know, challenging, but ultimately rewarding journey that she had through her life. So um, there, there's a, I'll say there's a lot, lot in big caps there. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. David. Indeed. And, um, yeah, I love how she chose one day that, okay, she was going to draw pictures of cats and that was how she was going to express herself. Um, fantastic. Um, there's even been a, um, like you said, Roger, her backstory is incredible and there's even been a uh, a short documentary film made about what she's, what she's been doing and um, her group, um, which won a telly award. Um, so I think that's going to be, um, if it's not already, that will be um, available to stream soon um yeah and she's talking about all sorts of different things and different directions this could go in like um meetups with other savants and q and a's and all sorts of things it's going to be really yeah. interesting to see where this goes you know what was interesting to me is to see what deanna focused on for her project because she has such a broad spectrum of art that she creates she's created a lot of nfts she sold a lot of nfts different styles, different, um, different concepts that's behind it. And that injury, it created this compulsion. She was compelled to do the cats, but she didn't know how to do it. But then, so she just like found it, found a software to do it. And then like, she intuitively knew how to use the software to create the cats. And then, uh, she had this other idea. She'd see a vision of some piece of art. And so then she'd just pull up another tool and then she'd create that art that she had in her, her mind. So all really fascinating stuff. Um, uh, Sister Soldier Savant is the book and I think it's the name of the documentary mm -hmm. as well. So I think folks will be interested to learn more about her. And then you can see her, she's, I think she's maybe minted on nine or 12 different uh, marketplaces, multiple blockchains as well. Uh, so she's a really good resource. If, you, if, you've, if you've never like, minted on a blockchain or something like that you just come into the niftorian discord uh and you know and and hit her up uh she'll probably have some insight for you there she's also probably used every every ai art tool there is right That's true. She, used, she uses like five or six in combination to create that's things. right yeah her, her so it's really there. interesting to hear her process right and of then like finish it off this tool and then tweak it over here and then move it over here and things. And so she's really familiar with those tools. And, uh, 
you know, it's it's very much a modern artist when you're using all these amazing tools right there. So um, yeah, fascinating and a good another thing to hit her up on is how do you use X, Y, or Z, or what have you used for? Because I know she'd love to love to share her experiences. And I think I think this project that she did is on async, and I think this is the first time she'd use async. So uh, really interesting. Okay, so uh, I think this is our last artist for today. Um, Retro Manny, 5D Starseed. David, you know a little bit about this. Yeah, I was talking to Manny about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, basically, he's, he's producing a book, and it's like a comic-style book, um, where he's taking some of the philosophy from The Matrix and presenting it as, as, presenting it as a children's story, but also something that would be... Um, valuable to adults as well. So there's going to be a, a strong message there for adults. Um, and it's really clever. It's very sci-fi. Um, but the way he's um, bringing it together as NFTs um, is, produce, is bringing lots of different ideas. So he's got ideas of um, presenting individual pages from the book um, as NFTs, and then you can um, bring them all together. So yeah, it's going to be very exciting to see what he does. Yeah, really, really good stuff. And I think, Roger, you'd seen Manny's art, but I don't know that you had any idea what he was going to present yesterday. I didn't. No, um, um, I, you know, I'd seen his art. I liked it, you know, that that um, that kind of st cyberpunk style. Uh, and then creating, you know, when I when he started talking about it, he's like, it'll be a kid's book. It kind of brought me back to being a teenager and loving sci-fi. Right. I, I get lost in Robert Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and those sure. kind of classic sci-fi books. And I was like, OK, and now you're actually creating this book with your imagery and your art that, to my mind, harkens back to that sci-fi. And you have these cyberpunk dystopian uh, uh, worlds there that um, I, I, you know, this this. This really resonates, and I I, I think it's great. Um, I think he uh, it, it's a clever it's a clever idea that's founded upon some roots that are that have proven to work well. So I, I think I think there's something good there. Yeah, there's the mechanic of the book for sure, but there's this interesting story because this idea of we live in three dimensions. There's a fourth dimension, which some people are aware of. They're not sure exactly what it is, but then there's this also. He proposes there's this fifth fifth dimension. That's not original with him. It's, but he starts talking about this fifth dimension, and the fifth dimension requires some understanding of the fourth dimension, tying together with the third dimension and the fifth dimension principles, and it actually is a really interesting concept about how you, we have these multiple timelines that could play forward, all the different things that could happen to you depending on what you do today, and essentially willing yourself into the favorable timeline, uh, which I thought was interesting. And so he was also someone who had a very long conversation in the breakout room afterwards. People were still talking about it because of the concepts of these, these timelines and the philosophy there, I think was uh, was very popular. And, and you know, his motivation about the illustrated novel was he wanted to express some of these ideas to children uh, earlier in life, because most people don't like encounter these ideas until uh, until they're well into adulthood. So that was really fun. That was demo day two. Uh, all the artists that participated. And I think that was we had a great time. We learned a lot. I think the artists learned a lot. And we had a good crowd in there too. So, you know, again, it's a private event basically, but you know, over a hundred people come in, they watch these things, they connect with the artists afterwards. It's a way for them to jumpstart their projects. And it's the capstone of the NFT artist accelerator. Any closing thoughts, uh, Roger? Yeah. Um, let this be the start of the conversation, not the end. So join our discord, go to niftorian.com. All the artists are in there. You can join them. Um, definitely follow them, right? Um, we gave you, you know, the, their Twitter and social media handles there. Um, but uh, yeah, love to hear whether you're an artist or a collector. If you're an artist and interested in the, the uh, accelerator, then please go and apply or just go to the Discord and start asking questions to learn more because we'd love to answer them. 
uh, or, or just as an artist, just to learn more from these other artists. We talked about some really innovative, unique things they're doing. And as a collector, uh, this is just such an amazing experience. Most of these artists, um, some have been very successful, as we've mentioned, in the, the offline, you know, physical world. But they're just emerging in the digital world. So, and then some are are brand new. Um, but I, you know, I, I see this as really a ground floor opportunity to um, collect some really interesting art um, that, uh, at a minimum, is super cool art. Uh, beyond that, may have a lot of value in the future. Yeah, I, uh, really well said. And you know, hit home that call to action. If you're an artist interested in going through the program, niftorian.com, click the accelerator tab at the top and you can learn more about the accelerator, more about the artists that have been through it and you can apply. There's a big button there. And that way we know who you are. We'll reach out to you over the next uh, month and a half. I'll uh, we'll set up an interview, see if you're a good fit. And you know, that's an opportunity for you to learn more from us about what, what the program is, but also for us to learn about you and see see if you're a fit. And then also there, and if you want to get real-time feedback from artists or from us, when you're on niftorian.com, you hit the button that says discord, jump in there. We're all in there. I'm creatorious Rex in there. We've got the Kibster. We've got David Conquest's conquistador um, in there. Hit up any of us in the general channel. And then the last one that I want to do just for our call to action is artist NFT artist con. Uh, we mentioned this at the top. You've got a bit.ly link there. You also have a QR code. Free event. It's going to be uh, mid-August. It's going to be designed for artists to help them understand the NFT space more uh, uh, more holistically, but also to like really ramp up quickly so they understand best practices, maybe identify some people who might be some good connections for you, but ultimately start yourself out on a good on a good path. Um, so there are a limited number of tickets for that. It's a virtual conference, um, but it's not unlimited. So I do recommend if you're interested, uh, sign up. Or if there's an artist in your life you think really could use a little bit of help uh, getting some orientation, hearing from some amazing speakers we have lined up, um, have them do it. David, any uh, final comments from you today? Um, yeah, if, you, if you're an artist and you want to learn more about the NFT space, but it's all feeling a bit overwhelming and there's just too much jargon and there's too much technology and there's too much going on, sign up for the accelerator because that's where we all, that's where we explain it all. And as you can see from the artists you've seen today, um, you can pull it together and produce your own demo day. Yeah. Some really interesting stuff. And this was, this was your first accelerator because you weren't, you weren't, uh, working on this during the first accelerator. So this was all new to you as well. Yeah, and it's been an amazing experience just meeting all these different artists from different backgrounds and different countries. Um, we had quite a few different countries involved. Um, so yeah, it's been a great experience trying to bring some of my experience from crypto to helping artists and really getting them um, up to speed with things and being able to present their own projects. It's been fantastic. So yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Really appreciate you, um, you know, being the director of the program for the second round. Uh, great job. Uh, really was a huge impact for everybody. Uh, and folks, if you want to learn more about the artists, if you wanted like a, an easy click through, if you didn't capture all those Twitter addresses, just look in the show notes, uh, or the comments below and you can just uh, click on, we, we actually have a document that has links for everybody. So that, that should be easy for you. Hey, please like, and subscribe to the channel uh, because we've got things like this. We talk about news, you know, this week in NFT news, which Scott Leach and I generally do. The Kipster has been, been my guest on that as well, but we talk about the latest and these are things that artists like it's really beneficial for them to know. Uh, so definitely check all these things out. Uh, Roger, David, thank you very much for your help today going through Demo Day. Thank you, Brett. Thank, thank you, you, David. All right, folks, you, until next week, happy hunting. Mm -hmm.